What's up everybody, Nick O'Dwyer back with you for the 10th inning and giving you another edition of This Day in Sports History. In yesterday's episode, we saw Lou Gehrig, the Iron Horse, start his consecutive game streak of 2,130 games played. We don't have anything quite like that today, but we still have a lot to get into it. If you're all new to the channel and you like what you see, hit that subscribe button. If you all enjoy this video, leave a like on it, it means a lot. And without further ado, Let's get into it. This day in sports history. We start off in 1891 with Charlie Radburn, Old Hoss Radburn, who notched his 300th career victory in a 10-8 win over the Boston Bean Eaters. This would be Radburn's final season of his 11-year career. He would end up with 310 wins at the end of this season for his career. This would be the first win of the season for him and his 300th. Then we move up to the 1934 French Championships. On the men's side, Gottfried von Krom wins his first of two French titles by beating Jack Crawford 6-4, 7-9, 3-6, 7-5, 6-3 in five sets. This would be the first of his two major victories on the single side. On the women's side, we saw Margaret Scriven defeat Helen Jacobs 7-5, 4-6, 6-1 in three sets. This would be back-to-back -back victories for Scriven as she won the previous year. This would also be her second French win and her second major victory of two major victories in her career. Move up a year later and we have the great Bambino finally calling it a career at age 40. He officially announced his retirement as a player. While that was happening in the United States, in France at the French Championships, Fred Perry won his only French title, defeating Gottfried von Krom 6-3, 3-6, 6-1, 6-3 in four sets. This would be the fifth major title of eight total majors for Perry. Then on the women's side, Hilde Krawinkel Sperling defeated Simone Matthew 6-2, 6-1 in two sets. This would be the first of three French titles, all consecutive victories for Sperling. And now we move up 27 years, but we go right back to the French championship. On the men's side, Rod Laver defeated Roy Emerson 3-6, 2-6, 6-3, 9-7, 6-2 in five sets. This would be the second leg of Laver's first Grand Slam title, so all four majors within the same year. This would also be his fourth major victory of 11 overall majors on the single game. Then on the women's side, Margaret Smith defeated her doubles partner, Leslie Turner, 6-3, 3-6, 7-5 in three sets. This would be her fourth major title. Now we get a little break from tennis and we move up to the 1971 European Cup, which saw Ajax going up against Penathinaikos. Ajax ended up winning 2-0, which began a three-year period of domination as they scored in the fifth minute, then added another goal in the 87th minute with Ari Hahn scoring the second goal for the victory. Now we move right back to the French Open as it's now called in 1973. Margaret Court defeated Chris Everett 6-7, 7-6, 6-4 for her fifth and final French victory. This would also be the 24th of her 25 total major titles. 12 years later in 1985 at the LPGA Championship at the Jack Nicholas Golf Course, Nancy Lopez won by eight shots over second place Alice Miller. Four years later in 1989 in the NBA at the Eastern Conference Finals, the Detroit Pistons defeated the Chicago Bulls four games to two. In game six, they won 103 to 94. The Bulls would win game one, Pistons got game two, the Bulls would get Game 3, and then the Pistons got 4, 5, and 6. Jordan did as much as he possibly could during the series. Averaged 29.7, but that Pistons team, too much to handle with Isaiah Thomas, Mark Aguirre, Dennis Rodman, Bill Lambeer, and Joe Dumars. It was too much for the Bulls. The Pistons ended up going to the Finals. Move over to Major League Baseball a year later, and Randy Johnson of the Seattle Mariners throws his first career no-hitter, as they defeat the Tigers 2 to nothing, Johnson, 9 innings pitched, 6 walks, 8 strikeouts on the day. At the 1996 U.S. Open for women, Anika Sorenstam retained her title 
by six shots over second place Chris Shetter. In the same year, the Seattle Supersonics defeated the Utah Jazz in the Western Conference Finals four games to three. The Sonics were up three games to one, and then the Jazz fought back, forcing a game seven. But in game seven, Sean Kemp scored 26 points along with 14 rebounds. Him and Gary Payton created a 1-2 duo that was better that season than the Malone-Stockton 1-2 duo, sending the Supersonics onto the final. Four years later, we stick with the NBA. In the Eastern Conference Final, the Indiana Pacers defeated the New York Knicks four games to two. The Pacers won games one and two, Knicks three and four, Pacers four and five to end the series. Reggie Miller scored 34 points in game six, and Jalen Rose also averaged 19 points throughout the series for the Pacers. The Knicks squad was really led by Latrell Sprewell and Allen Houston. It wouldn't be enough though, as the Pacers would move on. Then we move to baseball in 2000, and Fred McGriff becomes the 31st player to hit 400 career home runs. This came off of Glendon Rush of the Mets in the top of the 6th inning, which would give the Devil Rays a 3-2 lead. They ended up losing the game 5-3, but McGriff did his part. Right back to the NBA in 2002 in the Western Conference Finals, the Los Angeles Lakers defeated the Sacramento Kings 4 games to 3. Shaquille O'Neal had 35 points in Game 7, while Kobe Bryant had 30. Shaq averaged 30.3 points per game that series, while Kobe averaged 27.1. How did that series go to Game 7, you might ask? Well, their bench did absolutely nothing. That's why the Kings stayed in the series. For the Kings, Chris Webber averaged 24.3 points per game, and Mike Bibby averaged 22.7 to help keep them in there. It wasn't enough, though. Four years later, the 2006 Eastern Conference Finals, the Miami Heat defeated the Detroit Pistons four games to two. Dwayne Wade averaged 26.7, while Shaq averaged 21.7 and 10.5 rebounds. This proved to be too much for the Richard Hamilton and Chauncey Billup-led Pistons, with Hamilton averaging 20.7 and Billups averaging 18. A year later, the Pistons are back in the Eastern Conference Final once again, this time they would lose to Dwayne Wade's best friend, LeBron James. The Cleveland Cavaliers won in six games, won four to two. In game six, Daniel Gibson scored 31 points, securing the victory. But LeBron James was the hero of the whole series. 25.7 points, 9.2 boards, 8.5 assists. Zildrunas Ilgauskas also helped with 12.8 points per game, and it was too much for the kind of depleted Pistons at this point of Richard Hamilton and Chauncey Billups. Now we go back a decade, and it's amazing to think this has already been a decade because it seems like it was so recent. But we have Armando Galarraga of the Detroit Tigers. Throws a perfect game, but it's not called a perfect game. On the final out of the game, he goes to cover first base. Jim Joyce gets the call wrong though, ruins what could have been a perfect game. Now after the game, Jim Joyce would look at the replay and he did admit that he was wrong. He was wrong on the call. He costed this man a perfect game. Sadly, that's all he was able to do, though. You can't do much more than that. So he wasn't able to actually get a perfect game, but we all know it was a perfect game. Then finally, at the 2019 U.S. Open Women's Golf Tournament, Lee Jong Un wins her first major title and defeated the runners-up by two strokes. So there you have it. That's what happened on this day in sports history. If I left anything out, let me know down in the comments section. For Nick Dwyer and the 10th inning, see ya.